Hello, I'm Dr. Michael Clapper, and I've been a primary care physician for over 50 years. And during those decades, I've had occasion to treat quite a number of patients with inflammatory bowel disease and have some thoughts about those conditions that I'd like to share with you. So let me share my screen and talk to you about a presentation I've named the food factor, which can be a key to inflammatory bowel disease remission and reversal. Now, the question is, when the intestines look like this, in the middle of a nasty exacerbation of either Crohn's disease or colitis, when the mucosa is red hot and bleeding, does what the patient eats has any effect on the course of this disease? When I ask that question to gastroenterological colleagues, the answers I often get back from many of them are, look, diet doesn't matter. What the patient eats has no effect on these diseases. And besides, my Crohn's patients are so malnourished and underweight, I let them eat anything with calories to help them keep that weight up. And by the way, there has never been any studies that show that diet makes any difference at all in these conditions. To which I say, really? I will invite uh, the people with those beliefs to come back and review these slides that uh, refer to many studies showing that indeed what the patients eat has a tremendous effect on whether these conditions are exacerbated or put into remission. And the gastroenterologists very sincerely say, look, <clears throat> People are just not going to change what they eat. Uh, the Americans, Canadians, etc. They eat what they eat, and and by the way, I don't have time to talk to them about what they eat. And then incidentally, I wouldn't even know what to tell them anyway. Look, it's easier just to start them on the Humira or other injections because they work. And the American Gastroenterological Society uh, believes that as well. Uh, when they talk about therapy for these conditions, they just say match the patient uh, with specific diseases to whichever drug seems to be the most effective and reasonably safe. And this is the approach. It's a pharmacologic one primarily. And you certainly have an array of agents these days, very potent ones that inhibit various aspects of the immune system in order to put these uh, inflammatory diseases into remission. And there are guidelines to follow. Uh, and yes, you definitely should pick the proper one. But before we see them as the solution to inflammatory bowel disease, we have to realize that they're not all that affected. Uh, the remission and maintenance rates in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease are significantly less than 50%, and even less so in patients who have had prior exposure to another biological agent. In the Gemini 1 trial, patients with severe ulcerative colitis now, less than half the patients responded at six weeks. And very interestingly, a quarter of them responded to placebo. Uh, but the patients with moderate to severe Crohn's disease at six weeks on uh, these biologic agents, 15% uh, uh, of patients were in remission compared to you know half of that for placebo. And where there had been a previous uh, treatment failure, uh, again, at 10 weeks, you know, a quarter of the patients uh, had responded. Three quarters of the patients did not respond to these conditions. And these are not benign substances. There are consequences to suppress the immune system month after month after month. Uh, as we all know in biology, in something as complex as the human body, you can't do one thing. <laughs> you say, I'm just suppressing this patient's inflammatory condition in their intestine. Well, that's what you think you're doing. Uh, but the reality is you suppress someone's TNF-alpha month after month after month. You open the door to serious infections, tuberculosis, et cetera, fungal infections, uh, histoplasmosis, cryptococcus, viral and bacterial infections. Some nasty uh, malignant uh, conditions can be unleashed, some very aggressive lymphomas, uh, autoimmunity can result uh, from use of these conditions and the, of these uh, agents. And they can be hard on the liver, uh, setting off chemical hepatitis and hepatotoxicities and even heart failure. 
And these agents can be harsh with the bone marrow and leukopenia, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia can occur and uh, that has uh, vascular ramifications as well. And you may say, well, these are fairly rare complications. Yeah, but you're talking about giving these agents to millions and millions of people stretched over years. The, the odds of seeing some of these severe adverse reactions starts approaching a certainty after a while with enough patients treated long enough. But if only a quarter or a half of the patients are responding, why don't the other half? And how about the patients who initially responded and then they, they flare again? I have so-called treatment failure. They've become refractory. Why? I mean, we're scientists. It's not enough to say, well, that's just what happens. What happened there? Why do these people uh, become refractory? What is behind the treatment failures? Uh, the AGA tells us, well, if it fails with one drug, well, just change the drug and increase the dose. And again, they are solely focused on pharmacologic treatment for these conditions. I have to ask in this presentation, could we be leaving out something else, some other factor that promotes the relapses? Namely, <laughs> what our patients are eating, what they are flowing through that intestinal tract and smearing on those intestinal membranes three times a day, day after day, month after month, year after year. Is there anything in the standard American diet's food stream that could be initiating and maintaining this harsh inflammatory reaction? So again, the question, when the intestines are this inflamed, does diet make any difference? What the patient is smearing on those membranes, does it have any effect at all? And to come right down to it, is there no difference, doctor, between letting the patients eat chili dogs, french fries, black coffee, and beer on those intestinal membranes uh, versus uh, wet rice, mashed bananas, melon chunks, blended squash, or papayas? Is there no difference? Well, let's uh, see if we can uh, tease out uh, some meaning behind uh, these various uh, food patterns. Uh, the incidence of inflammatory bowel disease is rising globally. The question is why? What might be changing around the world? Well, diet is certainly changing as the Western fast food diet uh, infiltrates or metastasizes uh, to societies around the world. And yet, we look in the textbooks and the journal articles, the two words you run into again and again for the cause of these diseases, etiology unknown. We, um, no, we don't know what's the cause of these conditions. Well, let's look at some of the factors that people are postulating. Uh, genetics. Um, it's a genetic issue here. Well, yes, uh, there certainly seems to be a genetic component, but it's far from determinative. Uh, various studies have shown that in monozygotic twins, uh, if one uh, twin has Crohn's disease, uh, in two of the studies, only half the, uh, the other twin uh, gets Crohn's, and in one study, only 20%. And when it comes to ulcerative colitis, the incidence of, um, of the disease appearing in uh, the, uh, un the uh, other twin uh, is far less than half, 19%, 40%, 16%. So clearly, Genetics may be playing a role, but it's far from determinative, as far from a genetic disease as is a hemophilia. Well, it's an autoimmune disease, and we don't understand autoimmune diseases. Uh, and the, the articles clearly say inflammatory bowel disease and autoimmune disease whose pathophysiology remains uncertain. And so uh, uh, don't worry, let the researchers figure this out. We'll, we'll, we'll come up with more and more potent medications. Yes, there clearly is an autoimmune factor here, but uh, uh, and you find autoantibodies against neutrophils. Yes, when the intestinal mucosa is inflamed and bloody and infected and breaking apart uh, and cells are being lysed, absolutely, uh, as nucleic acids and nuclear material get exposed to the immune system, your lymphocytes are going to start making antibodies against those nuclear fragments and you know, various proteins and, and white blood cells. Yes, it's, um, it's inevitable you're going to see those autoantibodies, but are they the cause of the disease or is that just the tail of the dog that just shows up as a kind of the 
the uh, immune smoke, if you will, from the from this inflammatory fire that's burning in the walls of the gut. Uh, we will come back and explore that. But before we leave this, I want to point out that one particular uh, type of autoantibody that shows up is against Saccharomyces cerevisiae. This is this is brewer's yeast. Uh, this is uh, baker's yeast uh, that's found in both you know beer as well as uh, uh, bread products. Hmm, interesting. We'll come back to that. But uh, clearly, it's not a uh, purely autoimmune disease like lupus, et cetera. Well, stress is the problem. And we all know that in our patients with Crohn's or colitis, when they go under stress, they certainly are prone to a nasty uh, exacerbation of their symptoms. But most people in Western societies today are under some kind of severe stress, and most of them do not develop inflammatory bowel disease. That can't be the only causative factor here. How about environmental factors? Are there other things being smeared on those intestinal membranes? How about the, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories? What about uh, people drinking alcohol on a regular basis? They play a role, absolutely. And we'll talk to you a bit uh, about the, in what way that uh, alcohol and NSAIDs may be playing a role here. We'll come back to this one. We'll put a pin in it, so to speak. But then we have to focus on the microbes because we all know the intestinal tract is full of microbes and some of them certainly have been associated uh, with inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, there are several theories involving microbes. One is the persistent pathogen theory. And yes, uh, certain organisms, Mycobacterium avium species show up, especially the paratuberculosis uh, subspecies, but Clostridia and this adherent uh, version of um, of E. coli uh, certainly is found frequently. Are they the only cause? Again, they might be the tail of the draw. They may be the agents uh, of the inflammation, but not the direct primary cause. But yes, there's a microbial role. That certainly seems true. But then there's the excessive bacterial translocation theory and that normally the microbes just live in the surface mucus layer. Uh, and the very superficial cells of the intestinal tract. Uh, here's where the microbes should be living. Uh, but sometimes if the surface mucosal membrane gets disruptive, uh, the microbes will penetrate in deeper and counter uh, the lymphocytes and the other immune cells just in the lamina propria, uh, which then sets off this uh, hellacious inflammatory reaction that we're all well familiar with. The question is, how did these microbes uh, gain access to these deeper layers and uh, and the immune cells that lurk there. We'll come back and talk about how that might happen. <clears throat> and here we go back and pick up that pin. Uh, well, alcohol and ibuprofen, naproxen, et cetera, they damage the mucosa, and that might be part of the breach of the intestinal mucosa that allows the microbes to then penetrate deeper and initiate that aggressive immune response. <clears throat> But there's other substances in the Western diet. Look at the label uh, on a candy bar or ice cream, et cetera, and you'll see words like carboxymethylcellulose, polysorbate 80, carrageenan, mono and diglycerides. What are these molecules doing there? They are emulsifiers. They soften uh, the, uh, uh, the components of the candy bar, et cetera, uh, and increase the mouthfeel but they are emulsifiers. They will liquefy mucus. And this might be one of the facilitators that allow those microbes to penetrate deeper into the gut wall. <laughs> and then there's dish detergent. Who even thinks about that? But every time at the kitchen sink, you're washing the dishes, I uh, put a few drops of uh, the dish detergent on your sponge and wash the uh, wash your glass out. Well, you rinse the glass out once or twice or three times, but you never get rid of every last molecule of sodium lauryl sulfate or those other detergents. And so the next time you take that glass out and drink it, a little bit more detergent goes down your gut. Again, small, small amounts, but we're talking about week after week, month after month. You're, you're putting uh, uh, detergents out. The detergents liquefy mucus. Uh, is that part of the chemical assault that allows the microbes uh, to get into our gut wall? 
And so these microbes that show up there, what are they doing there? Hmm, what, what could have invited them in? We, we see the above mechanisms might be how they penetrate into the deeper tissues, but how, what, what prompted their, uh, their flourishing to begin with? <clears throat> well, we're talking, of course, about dysbiosis and an imbalance in the gut microbes. What factors could um, account for that? What could be the cause of the dysbiosis? Now, 200 years ago, this wasn't an issue. In fact, we were constantly freshening up our gut floor with our connection to the natural world. The, the deer and the antelope, they have natural gut flora because they're uh, eating uh, grass, etc., pulling up clumps of grass that have soil particles clinging to them, and, and the microbes in the soil particles uh, would, uh, would populate their gut microbes. And we did the same thing, basically. We would pull out uh, uh, vegetables from the soils of the garden, maybe rinse them under water, and then eat them. We would scrub them with chlorinated drinking water like we do now. Uh, before there was indoor plumbing, uh, when we were thirsty, we'd find the nearest stream and plop down and drink water. And we would certainly get uh, microbes from the stream water, natural organisms. And uh, when we dug wells, there'd be the, quote, na natural microbes in the well water. And so uh, the same microbes that populate the deer, the antelope's GI system, used to populate ours as well. But welcome to the 21st century. Nobody's eating unwashed vegetables. Nobody's drinking out of streams. Nobody's uh, drinking well water that's not been treated with chlorine. So the natural refreshing of our gut flora has been pretty much uh, disrupted. And I'm not against chlorinating the, <laughs> the municipal water supply. I don't want to be treating cases of cholera and typhoid fever. I'm sure you don't either. Uh, but in exchange for modern sanitation, it has cost us the uh, the connection with the natural world that used to keep our gut flora in balance. And instead, what are we pouring down our GI tract? A number of substances in the Western diet uh, that are inimical uh, to uh, uh, to normal gut flora that are quite damaging. Uh, uh, when they drink, we drink those cola drinks. Uh, we're drinking a solution of phosphoric acid. That's what gives cola drinks that bite on your tongue there. Uh, uh, it's certainly bactericidal. Uh, the foods are sprayed with pesticides, insecticides like, uh, like aldicarb, uh, and, uh, and that alters the gut microbiome. Of course, we drink that glass of wine with dinner, et cetera. That's going to change gut flora as well. And there's antibiotics in the food. They feed the antibiotics to the chicken and to the pigs and, res and residues of those antibiotics are in every uh, chicken breast and drumstick that people bite in to. And of course, when people have a runny nose or a scratchy throat, they go to the doctor and cajole them to, into in dispensing a prescription for amoxicillin or uh, Zithromax. Uh, and so there's this constant stream of you know, the substances coming down the gut floor that disrupt the normal bacterial balance. When we say, what is it opening the door to this dysbiosis? Well, we're certainly not helping uh, with a healthy bacterial flora with what we're eating, that's certain. And then there's glyphosate. Uh, who has even had this on their radar screen uh, until recently? This is the in the herbicide Roundup uh, that is so widely promoted now and used in agriculture pretty much worldwide. What's the problem with glyphosate, with Roundup? You may have heard about it. Let me explore that with you because it might be a real player in, in the dysbiosis we're seeing. What is glyphosate? In order to understand the action of glyphosate, you need to understand what's called the shikimate pathway. And thank heavens for the shikimate pathway. This is how the foods we eat, the vegetables we eat, create the absolute essential amino acids that we require, uh, uh, phenylalanine, tyrosine, tryptophan. Uh, the, these are essential for real. We need these and we don't make them as mammals. But plants do. How do plants make uh, these aromatic amino acids that we require? Uh, they take shikimic acid, and with the, with, through the use of an enzyme, EPSP sulfate, or synthase, um, they are able to complete the synthesis of these aromatic um, amino acids. Well, glyphosate blocks uh, EPSP synthase. Now, they block the shikimate pathway. 
And for that reason, it keeps the plants, uh, the, the, or the weeds, quote unquote, uh, from, from creating tryptophan, tyrosine, phenylalanine, and the plant dies without uh, these essential amino acids. And the folks who make Roundup and uh, the Monsanto chemists say, yay, look how smart we are. Uh, you can use this stuff liberally because we're mammals and our cells do not utilize the shikimate pathway. We do not make tryptophan and tyrosine. So relax, you can drink this stuff. It absolutely will not hurt mammals at all. Not to worry about it. That's what we have been told in the marketing. And yeah, it's true, we as mammals do not utilize the shikimate pathway, but our gut microbes certainly do. They are related to the plant kingdom, and they most certainly synthesize tryptophan and, and tyrosine and phenylalanine as part of their structural makeup. And they also use these uh, amino acids as neurotransmitters that they throw back and forth to turn enzymes on, turn enzymes off. And here we are, consuming foods uh, that unless they are clearly labeled as organic contain glyphosate. And uh, it's very clear that uh, in this study, our results demonstrate that more than half the human microbiome are intrinsically sensitive to glyphosate. And, and an inhibiting fact on the EPSP synthase from Tesla microbes has been reported and it affects mainly the beneficial bacteria. Uh, clostridium and salmonella and other troublemakers has, are actually fairly resistant to glyphosate. Consequently, research suggests that glyphosate can cause dysbiosis and the overgrowth of bacteria such as clostridia generates high levels of noxious metabolites that may open the door to inflammatory bowel disease. And if you look at the incidence uh, that has increased of inflammatory bowel disease uh, since 1991, it pretty much parallels the rise in the use of glyphosate. Now, it's a, just a correlation. You could probably make a similar graph for fast food uh, ingestion as well. But it's a worrisome factor that might be playing a role in the greater and greater numbers of people you're going to be seeing with inflammatory bowel disease. So here we are really assaulting our gut flora with, our, with the standard Western diet. And after we knock down a lot of beneficial microbes and promote the growth of pathogens, then, then we add a little bit of sugar. Now, I'm not talking about a half a teaspoon of maple syrup in your tea as a flavoring. That's how they're supposed to be used. I'm talking about eating sugar as a food. Uh, when you eat a, a cookies or the baked goods or the croissants or cakes. You're eating sugar as a food. Donuts are, are solidified sugar as a food. It was never meant to be eaten as a food. Chocolate bar, this is eating sugar as a food. Even if you add milk and freeze it, it's still sugar as a food. And, uh, and the soft drinks uh, that you buy in the store are just loaded with sugar. A little eight ounce bottle, a can of Coke um, has five and a half teaspoons of sugar, a little eight ounce a uh, can of Coke, uh, but who's drinking just a little eight ounce of it these days? You know, the kids are going in and get these big gulps and these big bottles, almost a quart of, uh, of cola drink, 13 teaspoons of sugar. And uh, so that certainly fuels the dysbiosis. When we're asking why these adherent uh, E. coli, where did they come from, these clostridia, what could be prompting their overgrowth? Well, certainly eating sugar as a food is probably a, a major player in that dysbiosis production. But there's another problem with eating sugar as a food, and that has to do with a chemical reaction every baker knows uh, called the Maillard reaction. Uh, when you add sugar to proteins. The sugar sticks to the protein. It glycosylates the protein. And then if you heat it, that glycosylated protein gets oxidized. And that's what they do in the bakery. They take the sugar and the pastry flour and combine it with the protein, wheat gluten, uh, and it glycosylates the wheat proteins. You need the bread. Uh, and then they put it in the, in the oven and the heat oxidizes the glycosylated protein. And that's what creates the crust on bread. Uh, the problem is it's full of what are called advanced glycation end products, the, the oxidized glycosylated protein, nasty substances. They teem with free radicals uh, that rip electrons off every 
passing molecule, including your DNA and your cell membranes. So it's okay to, uh, you know, no one need a lot of bread crust. It's full of these AGEs. Um, but it's one thing to create it on a surface of a French baguette. But you don't want to unleash advanced glycation end products in your own tissues. And that's what happens uh, when you cook uh, carbohydrates at high temperatures. All these baked goods are teeming with these AGEs uh, when you actually uh, uh, cook, make potato chips and you put the p starchy potato into the hot oil, you're going to create huge amount of AGEs. Uh, but again, just eating sugar, your own body heat uh, does, a, does a version of the Maillard reaction. And that increases uh, oxidative stress, uh, as well as NF-kappa beta activation in the gut wall. So not friendly when it comes to trying to control uh, the next outbreak of, of Crohn's or colitis in your patients. So vegan junk food, uh, the French fries and the chips and the donuts, all this stuff can, can do great damage to the body from all the AGEs. And if you don't remember the full day in advanced glycation end products, remember the acronym AGE, it can age, it ages you. And that's the problem uh, with, uh, with uh, AGEs unleashing the body. But it turns out that cooking carbohydrates and drinking sugars are not the major source of AGEs in the Western diet. It turns out <clears throat> cooking meat, cooking animal muscle generates by far the most AGEs. Grilling the burger, frying the chicken, frying the bacon, this is where most of the AGEs come from in the Western diet. And so uh, people are eating these three times a day, bacon, eggs for breakfast, cheeseburgers for lunch, chicken for dinner, we're, we're kind of bathing our gut wall with these AGEs uh, by cooking animal muscle. So another problem that the Western diet uh, uh, unleashes upon us on a regular basis. Most people are eating the, some version of the Western diet filled with AGEs and cooked animal muscle uh, three times a day. It's a high salt diet. There's salt in the chips, salt in the cheese, salt in the meats. Uh, and uh, we know, of course, that uh, excessive sodium can not only stiffen your arteries and make you retain fluid, and raise your blood pressure, increasing the risk for strokes. But we're now finding out that high sodium diets uh, activate TH17 helper cells, which sets off autoimmune diseases throughout the body, lupus, et cetera, but can also uh, increase the risk of inflammatory bowel disease um, by increasing uh, cytokines, et cetera. But when you add meat to the diet, those are all vegan junk foods, but when you add meat to the diet, now you're adding an entire new layer of molecules that can not only, of course, increase cardiovascular disease, but can be uh, major instigators in exacerbations of um, Crohn's or colitis. How? Well, nobody eats raw meat. The very act of putting that uh, chicken in the in the fryer, uh, putting the steak under the broiler, you're going to be oxidizing the cholesterol in the animal muscle, and oxy and you wind up creating oxysterols. Here's a standard cholesterol molecule. Put that uh, put that steak under the broiler. Uh, put the French fries in the boiling oil, you're going to create all these free radicals, which then will contact the patient's own cholesterol and rip electrons off of that. And when you will rip electrons off cholesterol, you create these cholesterol peroxides. And these are full of free radicals and, and play a role uh, in the um, uh, in uh, exacerbating inflammatory bowel disease. <clears throat> when you cook animal muscle under the broiler, when you broil the steak or grill the burger, um, you're going to be oxidizing the nucleic acids in the animal muscle, and that creates reactive aldehydes, lyaxyl, aquiline, and they are mutagenic. They damage genes, uh, the very genes that call forth enzymes in your tissues including those in the gut wall. And, uh, and that may uh, increase the risk for setting off another bout of Crohn's disease or colitis. Then there's endotoxin. You all remember endotoxin. It's been time in intensive care unit. You've seen people in endotoxic shock. 
where does endotoxin enter in the diet? It comes from the slaughterhouse activities. All animals pass through the slaughterhouse, even, uh, even organic grass-fed beef. And as the carcass is eviscerated and the gut are pulled out, if you get inevitable spillage of the gut bacteria on the cutting surfaces uh, in the meatpacking plant, and you can take a culture tube and swab any surface uh, in the meatpacking plant and grow a luxurious growth of uh, Salmonella, Shigella, E. coli, Citrobacter, uh, uh, Pseudomonas, the entire rogues gallery of, uh, of enteric pathogens coat every steak or chop or chicken breast leaving the meatpacking plant. Um, the, the piece of meat with this layer of enteric bacteria is uh, wrapped up in plastic, sent to your local supermarket where it sits in the meat case and the ultraviolet light shines down on the meat and kills those surface uh, GI pathogens. And as these gut bacteria die, their cell walls break apart and release a nasty lipopolysaccharide called endotoxin. <clears throat> uh, you're probably familiar with all the nasty properties of this uh, of this molecule. It depresses the myocardium, releases histamine, releases tumor necrosis factor, makes your blood clot, nasty stuff, endotoxin. And it's heat stable. Grilling the burger, frying the chicken does not get rid of the endotoxins. So people eating a meat-based diet are giving themselves a shot of endotoxin three times a day. And endotoxin makes your gut leaky. It increases the uh, intestinal permeability. And that may be a real player about how these adherent bacteria and other microbes are gaining access to the lamina propria and the deeper layers. In fact, they all the way out into our circulation, the setting off inflammatory reaction in joints and other tissues. Uh, and endotoxin might be playing a role. And again, our friends are eating a, a meat-based uh, diet are giving themselves a shot of endotoxin three times a day. Um, broccoli does not, steaming broccoli does not produce endotoxin, assuming that it wasn't contaminated during the harvesting process. Um, then there's TMAO, trimethylamine oxide. What, what is that? Where does that come from? Uh, again, the food we eat determines the microbes that live in our gut. And if you are eating a diet rich in meat and eggs, you are eating lots of carnitine in the meat and choline in the eggs. And that summons up microbes like peptostreptococci and clostridia who love to eat carnitine and choline. They turn it into trimethylamine that your liver oxidizes to trimethylamine oxide. From your artery standpoint, this is a molecule from hell. This um, uh, drives cholesterol into the artery walls, uh, prevents HDL from removing it. It's certainly a major uh, player in, uh, uh, in cardiovascular disease. But it's turning out that TMAO uh, makes E. coli more uh, resistant to antibiotics. So it clearly plays a role uh, in gut flora uh, uh, metabolism as well. Uh, then there's dietary heme that makes red meat red. Well, it induces gut dysbiosis, aggravates colitis. Uh, and again, the Animals in the feedlot are fed bushels of grains that are sprayed with pesticides and herbicides, and they drink water with lead and cadmium and mercury. They're given hormones and growth promoters, and antibiotics. All these molecules accumulate in the animal's muscles. So when your know, patients bite into that chicken breast or that burger, they're eating the concentrated uh, pesticides, herbicides, and toxins uh, that have accumulated in that animal's muscles over its life. This is part of the onslaught of the uh, of the Western diet that inflicts on, uh, upon our bodies. I call it the postprandial red tide, and uh, we could spend the rest of the lecture just on uh, the individual components. I've mentioned quite a number of them here, but it's a fatty tide. It's a salty tide. It's a sugary tide. It's antigenic. It's acid forming from all the sulfates and phosphates. Uh, it's mutagenic, damages genes. It's certainly carcinogenic. Uh, it's uh, from the cooking the animal muscle. It's atherogenic, it's pro-inflammatory. It disrupts enzyme reactions throughout the body, but it's certainly no friend of the patient with uh, inflammatory bowel disease because as these 
hitchhiker, these molecular terrorists, if you will, that the patient's uh, putting down their gut with every meal, as it flows along the gut wall, it's going to have effect directly upon the gut mucosa, not just upon the uh, microbiome, uh, microbiota that live in the gut wall, um, but it certainly affects the gut wall itself. And if you're eating three meals a day every year, that's over a thousand times a year you've flooded the, the gut mucosa uh, with these red tide molecules. And as scientists, how can we say that a, uh, that a uh, mixture of these molecules, endotoxic radicals, uh, detergents and aldehydes and alcohols and uh, rachidonic acid from the meat and fruit, that this has no effect on the patient's gut wall. Really, doctor? I mean, uh, how can we ignore this very, very powerful chemical influence here? There are studies that certainly uh, validate the concern about diet and inflammatory bowel disease, uh, high, flat, high fat, high sugar diets increase uh, uh, clostridium and other pathogens. Um, if you're eating lots of meat and, and as we mentioned, you're going to foster the, um, the population of firmicutes and clostridium microbes uh, that are pathogens to the gut wall. These are there's going to be a high fat diet, so that's going to make the liver put out more bile that comes down, and the, the clostridia and the firmicutes that you fostered with the high fat diet are waiting there, and they will take uh, that bile that's coming down at the gut and oxidize it into secondary bile acids that are can be quite toxic uh, to the uh, gut wall as well as hydrogen sulfide, etc. But if one is eating a diet high in whole plant fibers, uh, you, the population of firmicutes and clostridia recede a bit, and what flourishes are the beneficial Prevotella species. Um, and they are the gut wall friends. They will uh, digest the uh, fatty acids, the long chain fatty acids, into short chain butyrates uh, that promote the, the gut wall health, suppress inflammation, inhibit cancer growth. You know, we're plant eating hominids. We've got basically the same gut uh, arrangement that our gorilla and bonobo cousins have. And they're up in the trees eating leaves and fruits and developing these massive muscular bodies. And we've got a similar digestive system set up to digest plant fiber, not animal flesh. But there's other substances in the Western diet that can be a problem for our IBD patients. The vegetable oils that the fries are cooked in and the, and the salad dressings are full of, um, uh, they decrease the beneficial bacteroidetes uh, and they also increase gut permeability. They make the gut wall more permeable. And again, the fast food diet is filled with these vegetable oils. And that increases free radicals, increases the damage from the endotoxin that is also in the meat uh, based burger that the lunch that the patient is eating. Well, I think the food factor is something that we should not ignore. Uh, the standard Western diet seems to be full of substances that increase the risk for exacerbations of inflammatory bowel disease. Is there any good news? on the food front? Well, yes, there certainly is. Um, uh, studies have shown that diets rich in healthy fiber, complex carbohydrates, show less pathogenic species. Uh, they also increase the, the good guys, uh, the beneficial bifidobacteria, where refined sugars uh, mediate the overgrowth of opportunistic, opportunistic uh, bacteria like C. difficile and C. perfringens. Uh, eating an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Well, the one reason why it might is that uh, there's an oligoglactan in apples that suppress uh, endotoxin-induced uh, enzymes that cause so much of the uh, uh, of the damage that endotoxin induces. So uh, eat your apples and, and all the good plant uh, foods uh, that have some of these uh, beneficial um, um, uh, uh, fiber components. In studies on patients eating this predominantly or completely plant-based diet, they have a very different uh, uh, population of microbes in their colon. And maintaining a, a plant-based diet results in a significant shift of microbes while the total cell numbers remain unaltered. It doesn't damage the gut wall in, in any way, doesn't increase 
um, you know, plays your risk or anything like that. And here's a very interesting study. When they look in uh, the people in Japan who have a significant instance of Crohn's disease there, and they say, what are these people eating? When they look at a broad population, they see uh, a significant um, uh, uh, incidence of eating foods that contain high levels of total fat, animal fat, uh, omega-6 fatty acids and vegetable oils, animal protein, milk protein. Hmm, fat, animal fat, uh, uh, vegetable oils, animal protein, milk protein. Hmm, what kind of meal provides these kind of uh, uh, Crohn's enhancing sub, uh, uh, substances? Hmm, how about burgers, fries, and a shake? Uh, is that not uh, have the uh, an express package uh, of these molecules that uh, seem to be associated with Crohn's disease. These animal-based foods have no fiber at all in them. They're, where we see the fiber is certainly beneficial, not, you're not going to find it in a fast food diet. And remember, we saw a bit back that when we were looking at antibodies, we're finding out that uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae seems to be uh, one of the instigators for uh, for autoimmune uh, antibodies being generated. And indeed, uh, it turns out that uh, yeast may be a player. And in my patients with Crohn's disease, I have them pull out all the yeast products, all the baked goods, all the breads and the beer, any place that Saccharomyces is found probably uh, not the friend of the patients with inflammatory bowel disease. So I'm not the first one uh, talking about the role of dietary nutrients in IBD here. And the ben a beneficial diet has lots of fiber, lots of fruits and vegetables and uh, omega-3 fatty acids and plenty of vitamin D, promotes beneficial bacteria, decreases the pathobiont uh, population. And that's going to give you a nice healthy mucus, nice tight junctions between the cells and healthy uh, IgA molecules that uh, to suppress uh, 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 adverse uh, microbial activity. But if your diet is full of red meat and processed meats and food additives and sugars and uh, omega-6 fatty acids, uh, you're going to have decreased gut um, uh, diversity, decreased beneficial bacteria, and increased pathobionts. You're going to have uh, less healthy mucus secretion. Your junctions between the cells are going to become looser and allow more uh, uh, penetration of uh, antigens into the deeper layers. And as a result, this opens the gate uh, to inflammatory bowel disease. Very interesting study that, that gives us a little insight into this. And I say a little insight. I think it's a great insight, but it's a, it was a small study. Uh, this, again, was done in Japan. Uh, 22 Crohn's disease patients were placed into remission, either after a, a big uh, course of, uh, of steroids or the, uh, surgically they had the infl inflamed uh, gut sections removed. But 22 patients were currently in remission. The only advice they were given was to eat meat in your diet just once or twice a month, okay? Now, I have to stop it completely, but just hold it down. Instead of eating it every day and three times a day, just have it you know, once every other week. You have a small piece of fish or chicken or whatever. It's a semi-vegetarian diet. Of these 22 patients, 16 of them agreed to follow this diet. Um, uh, six of them decided not to. Fair enough. In the 16 who uh, maintain the semi-vegetarian diet, just had to meet once or twice a month. Remission was maintained 94%. Uh, well, here, I'll show you. Here we are at one year. Uh, the folks in the semi-vegetarian diet, a year later, all of them were still in remission, where um, half of the folks eating the meat had already relapsed. And at the two-year mark, 90% of the of those 16 folks were still in remission. Uh, sorry, my artist misspelled vegetarian there. Uh, but 90% uh, uh, um, uh, were still in remission where uh, uh, only a quarter of the folks eating the meat uh, were still in remission. It was a pretty dramatic uh, uh, 
uh, difference between a plant-based diet and an animal-based diet, so much so that one of the authors published this study in 2018 saying, we regard inflammatory bowel disease as a lifestyle disease caused mainly by our omnivorous Western diet. We have been providing a plant-based diet to all patients with inflammatory bowel disease since 2003. By incorporating a plant-based diet and treatment, we have achieved and published far better outcomes in both the active stage and quiescent stage in Crohn's disease than those reported previously. So coming back to the original question, if the gut wall looks like this, if it is inflamed and raw and bleeding and infected, does what the patient is eating, what they're smearing on those membranes three times a day make any difference? Um, does it make a difference if they're eating chili dogs, french fries, hot coffee and beer, uh, or uh, blended squash, papaya, uh, mashed bananas and rice congee, very wet, uh, loose rice uh, dish there. If they're... <clears throat> In inflammatory bowel disease, as you know well, there's an inflammatory fire burning in the wall of the gut, whether it's a small intestine or large intestine. I'm, uh, I'm not saying just give the patient bananas and they're gonna be fine. No, put the fire out. I'm a big proponent of using whatever it takes to, to suppress that, that hellacious inflammatory reaction. So whether it's um, corticosteroids or salicylates or course of antibiotics, whatever works for you, if I, I'm all for that. But the response that we classically get is, yeah, the prednisone works, but when you taper off the prednisone, well, they all flare again. That's right, doctor. If you keep letting them eat their chili dogs, black coffee, beer, and a, and a meat-based fast food diet, yep, that's what you're going to see. But my plea to you is take advantage of the respite once the patient's in remission and along with putting the patient in remission, that's the time to change their diet, is to make nice to that gut wall. You want to put foods uh, down uh, the intestinal tract that as they slide along the gut wall, they give the chemical message to the tissues and to the flora, shh, calm down, so okay. And again, uh, here's the classic foods that we use for the first few weeks and to, to settle down the patient's gut wall there, and mashed bananas and blended squash. And uh, you can look up how to make a kanji. It's just rice with lots of water in it. Uh, papayas, melodies, these are very soothing for the gut wall. So like Dr. Chiba, who published that study I just showed you, consider a whole food plant-based nutrition uh, as a foundation of effective therapy in inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, I have a four-page handout that I give to all my patients with inflammatory bowel disease, uh, and uh, I've made that available to your chief of service here. Anyone who would like to see this, you can go to my website, uh, drclapper.com, and you can download this for yourself. So here's my four-step regimen uh, for my patients with inflammatory bowel disease. You can modify it as you see fit. And the first thing to do uh, is stop the offending foods. You know, if you if a patient uh, is complaining of a headache, I said, when do you get the headache? Well, every time I hit myself in the head with a hammer, I'd say, well, why don't you stop doing that and see if we don't get improvement in the headaches. Same thing, stop the meat and the dairy and the oils and the refined sugar, stop the yeast and the process, stop all that stuff. Get them on a truly healing regimen, the steamed and blended vegetables, rice congees, green smoothies. Uh, recipe is on my website, but this is you know, basically blended kale and broccoli, um, a little bit of uh, almond milk and uh, maybe one banana fruit. So it doesn't taste like lawn clippings, but that's a very smooth, soothing mixture to slide along the gut wall while it's inflamed. And vegetable broth works very well. Uh, there are some supplements seem to be helpful. Um, uh, liquid magnesium uh, can help. Vitamin D uh, makes uh, all mucosal membranes stronger and healthier, and that's certainly of value here. Uh, these folks may have deficiencies of B12, B6, vitamin K. So good multivitamin that, that has these um, components to it, I think, can be beneficial. Um, there's some studies uh, indicating that, that wheatgrass juice, a shot of that every day, an ounce or two. Uh, curcumin that's in uh, uh, turmeric uh, spice uh, can be helpful as you add solid foods back in. 
and possibly uh, DHA, glucosinoxinoic acid and omega-3 fat can also have an anti-inflammatory effect. Um, and then look at the patient and their lifestyle. Are they under stress? Are they drinking alcohol? Are they taking ibuprofen? Are they eating lots of junk foods? Maybe they live in a food desert. How can you help these folks? So this is in uh, my four-step program while they're also on the prednisone or the, uh, uh, the salicylates, whatever else they need. And I continue this for a good 90 days. Uh, and until they are in complete remission, and and uh, and then we'll uh, and by this time we may have them down to just like five milligrams of prednisone, and then it doesn't have to go for full ninety days on the on the pharmaceutical agents there, but certainly as far as the diet goes, a good three months uh, on this absolutely, uh, and uh, and so, and then you start tapering off the. Uh, uh, the uh, salicylate to the steroids. And so again, uh, if you can get them in remission in 30 days, you, know, you can certainly start the steroid taper. It uh, doesn't have to go for full 90 days here. So the patient's going to be pestering you. Well, doc, when when can I go to McDonald's again? When, when can I go out for pizza with my friends? Uh, I just would hope after this presentation that you think twice about, oh, it's okay, eat whatever you want, um, because I think that's going to open the door to a nasty exacerbation. And you know, who really needs this food when it comes to your arteries and risk of heart attacks and strokes and, and autoimmune diseases? Uh, maybe this is a good opportunity to get not only your patients off these uh, these kind of foods, which aren't doing them any favors, but excuse me, maybe the, the doctor as well. Uh, can a patient uh, thrive on a whole food plant-based diet? Absolutely. I've got lots and lots of um, patients in my practice that consume plant-based foods exclusively, you know, oatmeal and fruit in, in the mornings, lunches and dinners, and colorful salads and hearty vegetable soups and um, uh, sweet potatoes. Uh, here's a, a, a vegetable taco here, uh, green and yellow vegetables, fruits for dessert. Uh, food, a diet, uh, a daily diet of foods like this can easily give you, you know, well over 80 grams of protein, lots of fiber. Uh, it's, and it'll bring down your blood pressure, cholesterol, et cetera. But absolutely, it's a, we don't need meat to be healthy in order to get protein. There's plenty of protein yeah, in, the, in the beans and peas, chickpeas and lentils and whole grains and nuts and seeds. Uh, protein deficiency is not an issue on a diet based on whole plant foods, not, not Oreo cookies and cola drinks. Uh, uh, but whole plant foods uh, will easily meet nutritional requirements. So uh, doctors who hear this say, listen, to, okay, fair enough. Uh, I see their sense in what you're saying, but look, I don't know anything about nutrition to, to talk to my patients. I don't get paid to do this counseling. I don't have time to do this counseling. I got a waiting room full of people out there. Well, the good news is, doctor, you don't have to do this counseling. There are trained professionals who are more than happy to do this counseling for you, if you just uh, do a search for plant-based dietitians, you'll find that they are everywhere. Uh, uh, here they are in Houston, here they are in Ann Arbor, Michigan, here they are in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, seek and you shall find. They're probably right on the staff in your own hospital. And if you have to talk to them about coming up with a dietary program uh, for your inpatients as well as your outpatients based on whole plant foods, um, it should not be difficult to do. There's plenty of help out there for you. Uh, and there are now gastroenterologists who have completely devoted their practice to plant-based nutrition and using this very powerful modality uh, to help their patients with these dreadful life-shattering diseases that Crohn's and colitis can be. Here's Vanessa Mendez down in Miami. Here's Will Bolswich in South Carolina. Here's uh, uh, Andy Sudeiki in Los Angeles. Uh, you can, you're not alone out there. There are doctors and GI specialists making this transition. And uh, I would submit that it's the wave of the future and suggest you might want to be one of them because plant-based nutrition plays a role not only in inflammatory bowel disease, but also in all the diseases you're spending your full clinic day treating. The patients with colon cancer are a far higher risk if they're consuming a, a meat-based diet, we've already talked about IBD, but appendicitis is uh, associated with a low fiber uh, uh, processed meat-based diet. Same with diverticulosis, uh, hiatal hernia, hemorrhoids, constipation, all of these 
are directly made worse by the, our low fiber, meat-based, overly processed uh, uh, Western diet. I have, a, I have a plaque on my office wall saying it's the food. <laughs> you know, doctor, why am I having these flare-ups? It's the food. And the corollary, it's been the food all along. And this is for my patients with high blood pressure and clogged arteries, but it's also for patients with uh, inflammatory bowel disease. So in answering the question that I posed at the very beginning, these diseases of uh, inflammation of the gut wall, does food make a difference? I humbly submit to you, absolutely, an inflammatory bowel disease and in all GI disease, absolutely, what your patients are eating makes all the difference in the world. And, and until that is dealt with, you're just going to be suppressing symptoms. You want to really heal these patients rather than just uh, treat their, uh, manage their chronic disease symptoms, uh, get them on a truly healing diet, and you can help these patients truly heal. I have a, a master class series, and one of them is devoted to uh, GI health. Uh, you can get that at my website, drclapper.com. So thank you very much for your uh, attention for this. Um, as I said, I invite you to go back, uh, have a look at the many studies that I've cited. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, your chief of service uh, knows how to contact me, but you can do it through my website, uh, drclapper.com. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, I will wish you uh, great success in treating your, uh, uh, your IBD patients. The <clears throat> German philosopher Goethe said, what you know about, you see. Once you know about something, you start seeing it. Well, hopefully you now know something about what your patients are eating and the uh, course of their inflammatory bowel disease condition. Uh, hopefully you'll now be able to get them on a more truly healing course. Thank you very much. I wish you and your patients all the best.